Hello, and thank you so much for checking out this week's message. Whether you're watching somewhere online or listening to the podcast, we're so grateful that you're with us today. So this summer, we're going through a handful of our favorite stories from the life of Jesus. And today, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into a story that you've probably heard before, but it's honestly one that's a little bit harder to understand. And so today is week two of our new series, The One With, where Pastor Brent's going to lead us through the story of The One With the Pigs. Well, good morning. So we're going to jump into Mark chapter 5 and a story we're calling The One with the Pigs. So it's in the series we're in, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I was surprised to find out that our good friends, Paul and Sarah Rogast, who are missionaries in France have come here for a short season. I saw him yesterday and said, you have to share. So right away, let's give them a big welcome home, okay? Uh, Paul grew up in this church, Sarah close by in a neighboring town, and they've been serving in France for how long now? Six years. All together? Yeah, uh, yeah, six years. So they've got a tremendous ministry. We pray for them. We help support them financially, but we got to hear from them. So I got two questions, Um, one for Sarah, one for Paul. Sarah, uh, it's hard work serving overseas and making (laughs) progress, and, you know, France isn't always the most welcoming country to the name of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But you are there for the glory of God, and you're doing a great job. But give us uh, an inroad, uh, a victory, something that you're encouraged about in your ministry there in France. Mm -hmm. So um, one of our roles where we're at is serving the community, and we've been doing that a lot kind of from our corner uh, with kids' tutoring programs and women's groups and different things like that. But recently, in the last few months, we've been able to be part of several different conversations with other associations in our neighborhood, with some government groups that are doing some city planning and kind of dreaming for how to make our city a better place. And so it's been really a gift to be able to be a voice in on those conversations, um, a voice that's that's influenced by the teachings of Jesus and to to bring our faith into those conversations because it's not something that usually happens in France, and so that's been a huge right, gift. That's, that's <laughs> tremendous. There are a lot of countries that are what we'd call secular. That is, they just don't have a religious base, and for a lot of countries uh, in uh, Western Europe, it's not that they're outright atheists. They are, but they just don't ever think about God, and uh, so you're starting at really level one to like plant seeds. And so I that's tremendous that you can begin to have influence in your community that way. Um, one way we can pray. Yeah, it's been really neat uh, these last few months. It seems like the Lord has just opened the door to uh, that, that young men that I've been in a relationship with, uh, some for five years now and some for just a matter of months, uh, but a couple of young Syrian men and another Afghan man in our neighborhood uh, have just outright asked uh, for a Bible to start reading and exploring and so journeying with these men, some with conversations and relationships for years and some very new, and so it's just been a real privilege to, yeah, see God doing things and having worked in the background and just being there to, to journey with these men, hopefully in, in a long relationship with the Lord and uh, discovering him. That's, that's tremendous. So I tell you, Paul and Sarah, thank you for being you, uh, willing to take the risk, moving your family, your, your daughters, and, and trying to be the Elijah. So we're really proud of you, and we're thankful for you. I want to pray for you, and then we'll launch into the sermon. Father, for Paul and Sarah and their, their beautiful daughters, we pray for your protection physically, uh, emotionally, financially, spiritually. Uh, they have uh, responded to what you told them to do, and they have entrenched themselves into their community. So thank you for the, the seeds that are being planted. And I pray that they would see uh, people get saved. We pray for these three men, that, that Paul is the two Syrians and the Afghan, and uh, that they would uh, one day, if they haven't already, to just embrace Jesus as the one and only. And so bless them. Thank you for their perseverance. Keep them encouraged. And we thank you for that uh, nation of France this morning. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give my hand one more time. Thank you so much. Well, we are, we are in week two of a five-week series looking at five compelling stories from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, all of which Jesus is the center of each of these stories. Now, last week was the story, we called it the one with the alabaster jar, where this lady dumped $25,000 worth of perfume on Jesus' head, and that absurd and uh, at least from the outside, wasteful act of loyalty and worship was actually a call for us to give our first and our best to Jesus because he's given everything for us. So that was the one with the alabaster jar. Today, the one with the pig. So we're in Mark chapter five. We're gonna dive into some deep stuff today, so pay attention, all right? Mark chapter five, we'll walk through 20 verses this morning uh, to unpack this story, the one with the pigs. This is how it starts. Then Jesus and the disciples came to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to the region of the Gerasenes. So a couple maps in front of you here. Uh, The map on the left has three circles. Jesus spent most of his time in Judea to the south, Samaria in the middle, and Galilee to the north. That's about 75-ish miles from north to south. That's where he spent most of his time. Now, in Mark chapter 4, now we're moving to the map on the right. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is preaching somewhere on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And he gets in a boat with his disciples, this is Mark 5 verse 1, and he crosses to the other side. Now that journey across included something involving a storm and Jesus calming it, okay? But now they arrive on the opposite side of the Sea of Galilee at a place called the Gerasenes. It's sometimes pronounced Gergesi. It has several spellings, but it's actually part of what's called the Decapolis. Uh, Deca is 10, so it's 10 little villages. So he's over there. That's when the drama begins. Verse two. As soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs, that's the the city cemetery, and met Jesus. He lived in the tombs. No one was able to restrain him anymore, even with chains, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had snapped the chains and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And always, night and day, he was crying out among the tombs in the mountains and cutting himself with stones. So here is a a demon-possessed man who uh, has a superhuman strength. Uh, He's terrorizing the community. (laughs) And again and again, they try and chain his hands and shackle his feet, but he just busts them and he's... He's zombie-like, I imagine, walking through the graveyard, screaming, and cutting himself with stones. Okay? Verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt before him. And he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. So, from a distance, so Jesus is arriving on the boat. He's over there being his, his demon-possessed zombie guy, you know, he's all crazied up, okay? And he sees Jesus from a distance, and he immediately knew who Jesus was. Evil spirits always recognize Jesus, not so with people. People don't always recognize who God is. In John chapter 1, verse 10, it says that Jesus came to earth and people did not receive him. They didn't recognize him. There could be people who were face to face with Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, and people would not realize that they were face to face with God himself. So people don't always recognize who God is. Demons always recognize. So this demon recognized Jesus, this man, and he ran and he knelt before him. 
because he recognized that he was pitted against vastly superior firepower, (laughs) okay? So he knelt before Jesus and declared him to be the Son of God and said, don't torment me. Now verse 8 throws us for a little loop. It says, for Jesus had, and I could add the word already, for Jesus had already told the man, told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So apparently, the way Mark tells this story, apparently Jesus is arriving on the boat. He may have been in the boat, still coming up, and the demon-possessed man, recognizing he's now in a battle with the Son of God, he recognizes Jesus, but Jesus immediately recognized him. And at that moment, Jesus said, come out, but the demon didn't obey. At that point, the demon-possessed man ran to Jesus, knelt, said, what do you want with me, son of the most high God? Don't torment me, okay? That takes us to verse nine. Jesus asked, what's your name? And the man answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, a legion is 6,000 Roman soldiers. That was a legion. So he, he answered, what is your name, with a number, 6,000. My name is 6,000. Now, that, the point is, he didn't have just one demon, but he had lots of demons. Okay? And he kept begging Jesus, this verse 10, not to send them out of the region. Now, a large herd, here they come into our story, of pigs were there, feeding on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us to the pigs so we may enter them. Demons are not content just to float around in open space because you can't torment air. Demons want to be in something. They want to torment something. They want an object to to destroy. And so this, this, this man with this legion of demons, okay, He saw the handwriting on the wall. He knew he was outmanned and outgunned by the Son of God, and he knew he was going to be expelled out of this man. Legion was going to be expelled. He was was wise enough not to ask if he could go into the disciples because Jesus would not have allowed that. He glances around. There's a herd of pigs. He says, what about them? At least I can torment something. Verse 13. And Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And get this. And the herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. The men who tended them ran off and reported it in the town and the countryside. And people went to see what had happened. Like they went to the edge of the cliff to see 2,000 floating pigs in the water. I mean, they went to see what had happened, okay? They came to Jesus, verse 15, and saw the man who had been demon-possessed by the legion sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So their fear was connected to the man. Remember that. They saw the man, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. The eyewitnesses described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs. Then they began to beg him, Jesus, to leave the region. I think a lot of us uh, move to the financial implications of this story. That's the first place our minds go, like someone lost their livelihood. What's with that? Like, that's not fair, right? Um, in my little three and a half pounds, I, I just wonder, did they have pig insurance? <laughs> or was there that little clause in the contract, unless they're demon-possessed, <laughs> you know? Uh, did, did anyone try to take Jesus to court? Did they call the police and try and file a report? Police are there. Oh, what happened? Pigs ran off the cliff. They drowned. How come? Demons. 
Like, how's that land with a police report? I, I have these questions about why and what happened, and, and all I know is I don't have answers to those questions. But two things are pretty clear in this story. One of them is that Jesus had just shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that the true intent of demons is to, to destroy, is to torment, is to kill. That's one thing we know for sure. Jesus is sending this loud and clear message that demons have one agenda, destroy. Another clear thing from this story, this is, might catch you as a bit new, but the fate of the pigs was not their primary concern of the townspeople. Right? That wasn't their primary concern. They weren't frightened by literally what happened to the pigs. They were frightened to see a man that had, that had terrorized their community for years. They had kept their kids in the front yard because they were scared of this maniac, demon-possessed man that they had tried again and again to shackle, and he just busted everything. He had superhuman strength, and he's moaning and crying, zombie-like, and he's cutting himself, and, and all they know is that this man that terrorized them, that they had tried to shackle and chain for years, and a word from Jesus was now healed, and that scared them. The pigs became a secondary story because the man sitting there in his right mind, fully clothed, now was the main line of the story. And they were afraid. So they asked him to leave. They begged him to leave. Um, they didn't know what to do with this Jesus. Like, what else is going to happen? Just leave, right? Now, what's interesting is um, two chapters later in, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus returned to the Decapolis, the same area, and they welcomed him with open arms. So in Mark 7, verse 37, it says, they were extremely astonished in the Decapolis, the Gerizines, right there, and said, and this is one of my favorite lines in the Bible, Jesus does everything well. Isn't that a great line? He does everything well. We do a few things well. But Jesus, he has done everything well. He even makes deaf people hear and people unable to speak talk. Now, what changed between chapter 5 where they begged him to leave after seeing his power and Mark 7 where they wanted him to stay when they saw his power? What changed? I wonder if it was the testimony, the word of this formerly demon-possessed man who wouldn't stop talking about it and their hearts were warmed eventually to now welcome this same Jesus back. Here's how the story ends. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed kept begging Jesus to be with him, but Jesus would not let him. Instead, Jesus told him, go back home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and they were all amazed. So that's our story for today. Now we ask, what do we do with it? <laughs> so uh, it's been said that the Bible has truths to believe and commands to obey. And when you read your Bible during the week, and I hope you read your Bible during the week, when you read the Bible, these are just two great questions to ask. What am I supposed to believe, and what am I supposed to do? So a truth to be believed would be God is love. God never leaves me. God has forgiven all my sins. Those are truths to believe. And when you read the Bible, you're always supposed to be asking, okay, God, what do you want me to believe, put my faith in? And then there are commands to obey. And when you read your Bible, say, okay, what am I supposed to do? Be nice, forgive, don't do that, do that, all right? So I have a couple of truths to believe and one command to obey that I want to drop in your laps and you can take this sermon home with you, the one with the pigs, okay? Here's the first truth to be believed. Satan and his demons are real. They still attack, they still oppress, they still possess people and they are hell-bent on destruction. That's a truth that God is asking us to believe. 
Uh, there are a lot of people out here, I understand, I guess, they, they just say, I don't believe in, in demons or the devil. Uh, I, I don't, you know, and that's, everyone has a right to believe what they want to believe, right? My personal thought is, how else can you explain the, the cruddy place our world is at except for the existence of a spiritual evil power? Like, I have no other way that can rationally explain the mess our world is in apart from the existence of the devil and his demons. I have no rational, there's no rational explanation for that. But this is still something that we have to choose to believe or not. The scripture nowhere, the Bible nowhere hints that the devil is now neutered or spayed or whatever he is. The Bible doesn't even hint at the possibility that the devil has less power than he used to have, that he no longer tempts or no longer oppresses or possesses. We'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 4.4 4 calls Satan the God of this age, small g. Okay? These are some of the names that the Bible gives to Satan. The adversary, Beelzebub, which means ruler of demons, deceiver, accuser, enemy, evil one, liar, murderer, ruler of this world, thief. You see, you can't fight an enemy you don't name. How do you fight something you don't know about? You name the enemy, and the enemy is the devil and his demons. And he is the accuser, the father of lies, the destroyer, the thief, the, the ruler of this age. He is that, and now we've named the enemy. We acknowledge that he exists, and he has power, and now we can fight him. Most of us would agree that the devil does tempt us, I would think. But there are two other words I want to drop on us today. The devil oppresses us and the devil possesses. So the short statement would be the devil can oppress Christians. The devil cannot possess Christians. So think oppress, he can oppress Christians from the outside. He can possess people from the inside. But he can't possess Christians because we are bought with the blood of Jesus and we have been inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God. Our spirit has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We as followers of Christ cannot be possessed. We can be oppressed. So in Ephesians 4.27 it says, don't give the devil a foothold an opportunity. So imagine your brain, your mind, is kind of a rough rock cliff, and there are crevices there. And we can give the devil, this mountain climber, you know, we can give the devil an opportunity to kind of lock on to a part of our life. He tempts us, and then we give in, and we give in again and again and again and again. Whether we, it, it can start with, you just watch a, a little bad show, and then a more media, 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 and you go into some deep and dark stuff on the media. Or you look at foul language. You cuss once, you drop the F-bomb every now and then, but you keep giving the devil a foothold. And he latches onto you, oppresses you, and now you have the habit of the F-bomb. You're cussing all the time. You cuss without thinking. You don't even feel like you have an opportunity to resist it. You now no longer control yourself. The Lord doesn't control you. What's left? The devil controls you. Okay? We have to be cautious in our semantics. Language is important. Uh, we need to choose our words carefully. But I'm asking the question, what's the difference between a bad habit of cussing and being demon oppressed in that area of our life where he actually controls us in that area? You might, you might be controlled by God in nine areas out of 10, but you have given the, the devil a foothold, okay? In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says the spiritual weapons we fight with have power to demolish strongholds. That word is only used one in the New Testament, but it's the idea of a fortress, a stronghold, where the devil can have a stronghold in your life. He oppresses you, okay? Now, we're still responsible for this sin, but 
don't, don't fool yourself. Christian you might be, but if you give the devil an opportunity, there will come a day when you are oppressed by the enemy. He's latched on. And to defeat that, you need to bring that sin into the light, confess it to God and man. Fight it for all your worth. It's gonna take a fight because he has now locked onto you in that area of your life. You are oppressed. Bad habit, call it that if you want. Okay? Now what about demon possession? So this last week I asked a handful of people, no, no strangers at Walmart or anything, uh, but I asked a handful of people, uh, hey, uh, people in the office or people I've been running into from our church, I said, hey, have you ever seen a demon-possessed person? And they all went, huh? <laughs> like, what's your agenda, Brent? You know? And I, I said, no, no, it's just a sermon. Oh, okay. And what's a demon-possessed person look like? Are there still demon-possessed people today? Do you see them? I mean, possessed, not just oppressed. They're inhabited by by the legion, so to speak. Um, If you've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you you might have thought, wow, it seems everywhere Jesus went there were demon-possessed people. Do you ever feel like that? Everywhere he went, there were demon-possessed people. And does that mean there were more back then there, than there are now? How's this work? Have you, have you ever stood and looked at an open pasture, a field? It's got some six, six inches of grass. It's a beautiful field. It looks all calm. But then you walk through it, and grasshoppers start jumping up everywhere, and flies and other flying vermin or whatever, Right? Uh, It looked safe and calm, so to speak, but your footsteps roused up the grasshoppers, right? I wonder if the holy, perfect feet of the Son of God, Jesus, when he stepped into the field of this earth, the darkness of the demonic could not stay, stay down, where they could hide when just normal people were walking through the field. Does that make any sense? I'm just trying to explore in my own mind, are there more people that are demon-possessed? Less? I don't know, but I, I do know that the feet of the Son of God caused the demonic to run and kneel before him. The symptoms, so to speak, of a demon-possessed person in the New Testament. Often it was superhuman strength. They knew secrets that others didn't. The biggest, you are the son of God. Like other people wouldn't have known that. But the demonic know the secrets of the world, so to speak. So superhuman strength, maybe knowing some secrets. Uh, Voices, sometimes uh, they would speak and scholars wonder if they would have a different tone, a different voice inflection of the demonic, that it wasn't the human speaking, it was the demon within him. Uh, Self-harm, cutting himself with stones. Now here's where we need to be really, really cautious. Some of these symptoms, so to speak, of demon-possessed people in the New Testament are just normal illnesses. You might look at a person and they're twitching and flailing. Is that demonic or is it some kind of medically explainable twitch or epilepsy or something, right? Uh, There are people with severe, what I would call severe mental illness. And we need to Uh, recognize that just because they have chemical imbalance and trauma in their past and they're dealing with some junk and they have what we might label severe mental illness, don't assume that, no, that demon possession, no. I'm exploring with you, uh, with my questions of what it looks like today. But this I'll stand toe to toe with anyone. The devil is still alive. And his demons have one intent, and that is to hurt, destroy, torment, and kill. He will tempt us, he will oppress us, and he will possess people. I don't always know what that looks like. I just know Jesus, Jesus, 
Jesus has the power. Okay? That's a truth to be believed. Um, uh, a command to obey. And this one really comes from 1 Peter 5, 7 that says, be alert, be self-controlled, eyes wide open. Uh, your enemy, the devil, is prowling around trying to, to, to sneak up and catch you. And the command, not out of the, just out of the story, the one with the pigs, but throughout Scripture is be alert to the devil's schemes, right? Uh, I... Uh, I enjoy, uh, don't judge me, don't send me an email. I enjoy scaring people in the office. Uh, frankly, in all humility, it's one of my spiritual gifts. Uh, but yeah, it's just like I go up and ah! And Jesus and I just enjoy watching them ele- elevate a little, you know? Uh, sometimes I regret it. I do that to somebody and something comes out of their mouth that they're embarrassed about. And I think that's funny too, but uh, uh, one time I scared a person in the office and she turned around so quickly she threw her neck out and had to go to the chiropractor. (laughs) I felt bad about that. Workman's comp was kind of complicated on that one. Uh, No, we didn't do workman's comp. It was okay. And uh, it's not that just I'm trying to be the devil among our our office. Um, but that's who the devil is. And uh, just like, hey, you in the office? Just always think I'm around the corner. That's the good way to live. <laughs> be alert. We ought to always be ready, alert, that the devil's crouching around the corner. He's going to scare us. That when we hop in the car in the morning, we just assume that the devil's going to, like, oppress some other driver to torment us. <laughs> and we're alert. Uh, we're alert that God is going to allow uh, extra grace required, I call them EGR people, like hard to love people into our lives and that's going to be the devil honestly trying to trip us up and we need to be alert. We need to be self-controlled. We go through our days oblivious and naive. We can go all day, all week and not once think about the enemy that is on the attack behind every corner and crouching ready to get us. And we need to be, this is a command to obey. Okay, one, one more uh, truth to be believed. Romans 16, 20 says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. It's a It's too much to unpack today. But it's an ironic statement that the God of peace will do a violent act. Crush Satan. Isn't that interesting? The God who is there to bring peace with him and give us peace is going to do this violent act of crushing Jesus. But it's not that God's going to crush Jesus. He's going to crush Jesus under whose feet? Our feet. A day, and this is a truth you can believe or not, but the Bible says believe this, that there's a day coming, and I imagine Jesus with massive infinite arms is going to wrap his arms around every saint and believer throughout the ages, and he's going to tie Satan down, and he's going to wrap his arms around us, and boom, we are going to crush Satan's head, right? For all the times, for all the times that you and I are going to stumble. For the hundreds and thousands of times that we will give in to the devil. And we will say things and we will think things and we will do things. For all the times we climb up onto the hill of regret and say, why was I so stupid to do the same thing again? For all the times we unfortunately live in a cycle of shame, forgetting that we've been forgiven, all right? But for all those defeats, a day is coming when we will crush Satan's head. That, my friend, is what you have a choice of believing or not. Don't walk out of here thinking the devil's got the upper hand. He is outgunned and outmanned by Jesus Christ and the saints of God. We're part of that. Okay? Hmm. One last, last thing to believe. Okay? Jesus is the Son of God, the only Savior of the world. 
the one who loves you more than you understand, the one who will offer you forgiveness if you only say, I believe. And I'm saying, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Well, I'm at the end of my notes and we're at the end of the hour. Uh, I don't say this enough, but thanks for listening. Well, okay, thanks for looking like you're listening. Um, I don't take for granted that um, I have the privilege of trying to shepherd and guide us with this uh, authoritative word of God. And so I say thank you for that. And let's take this sermon home, okay? Things we believe, truths we believe, commands to obey all right I want to pray for you I know there are people here where there are strongholds in their life habits they're stuck in where they have and we've all done it there's not a person immune to this they have given the devil a foothold and you may be following God in five six seven eight areas out of ten but you know that you're caught right now and you need to be set free And I want to pray that you will take that sin into the light. That is, you will renounce it to Jesus and to others, all right, someone else, and that you will find freedom, and that the devil that has locked on to that part of you, oppressing you, will be hurled off the cliff of your mind and life, just like those pigs we're hurled off the cliff and that you will be set free. I'm going to hang around up here. And if you have questions about this whole demonic thing, ask somebody else, okay? <laughs> now, if you have questions, I'd be glad to, to listen. I may or may not have answers. This is kind of a heavy sermon. But don't walk out of here forgetting that Jesus, he's the one. He's the one. So I want to pray for you and over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over this band of people. I imagine most of them have said, I believe in Jesus. But for this whole group, I pray that, that uh, whatever oppression, whatever stronghold, whatever bad habit, call it what we want, that is catching them, that they would bring it to the light, they would confess it, they would renounce it, and that they would say to the devil, go to hell where you belong. I command you, release yourself from me. I want freedom. Jesus has died for me. He has set me free. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I pray that that fight would not, that we would not let up in that fight against the devil and his darkness. Thank you that the devil is outgunned and outmanned by the name of Jesus and we declare our allegiance to that name and no other name and it's in his name that I pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great week. Well thanks again to Pastor Brent for that great message and thank you to you for watching or listening wherever you are today. So if you're watching the week that we recorded this sermon, it's kind of the end of August. We're getting ready to launch all of our fall ministries here at Ridgepoint. And Russia is still looking for some volunteer help. So if you've been coming for a while and maybe you're looking for a way to get a little bit more plugged in, maybe meet some new people, use your gifts to serve, volunteering around here might be a great next step for you. So we have a list of all of our current open positions at ridgepointwichita.com volunteer. And even if you're watching weeks or months from now, all of our latest volunteer opportunities are always listed on that page. So we encourage you, if you've been watching, attending for a while, want to get more plugged in, check out our volunteer opportunities. There's no obligation. There's nothing that you have to sign up for. We'll just let you know some of the basics and you can decide if it's a good fit for you and your schedule. We'd love your help, but even if you don't do that, we'd love to see you again here next time. Whether you watch online or come in person, we're always here for you at Ridge Point. We hope to see you again soon.